Christian. So uh, the, the title of our devotional is A Crisis of Faith, and that famous uh, expression of Esther, that wonderful resignment, and she says, and if I perish, I perish. Have you ever had one of those uh, times in life that you're going through a challenge, you're going through trials, you're, you're going to face a potential conflict, a confrontation, and in some ways you feel like, well, Lord, spiritually I'm going to have to walk this plank, and I just trust it's not cut off on the end too short. And I think we all face that. We face crisis in our life. It might be with a family. It might be at work. Uh, it might be at school. But there are times that we're challenged of whether or not we're going to be faithful. And uh, that's the challenge here. So let me walk you through this tonight and uh, fill in the blanks as I go through it. I've got a lot of the verses up there. But uh, the book of Esther, and I shared a little bit of this Sunday morning, is a study of God's sovereignty and providential care of his people. Isn't it a wonderful thing to know that God is interested in you? He's interested in the things that affect you. He's interested in the events that are happening around you, not just on a national way, but on a personal and a family way. And then on Sunday, I introduced to you five main characters uh, in our study. So I want to walk you through those. And it's on your outline there. The first is Ahasuerus. He's the king of Persia from 486 to 465 BC. He has a son by the name of Artaxerxes. If you are doing your devotions with me in Nehemiah, you've already met Artaxerxes. He is the king at that writing. <clears throat> and so uh, Esther, the book of Esther, and, and uh, Nehemiah, uh, Nehemiah will follow after this book, probably about 30 years later. But as we come to Ahasuerus, it's a different time, it's a different place, it's the same God who is at work. So King of Persia, in the area that we would know as Babylon, all through Iran, Iraq, all through that area. But Persia eventually reached all the way to Africa, all the way uh, as far as India. And so it was a vast empire. And then there was Queen Vashti. And she was banished from her throne. So let's be interactive. Why was she banished from her throne? She refused to obey the king, right? What was the king asking her to do? And she said, not a chance. What was it? Yeah, put on her crown and go to, in front of the men and be seductive, right? Be an object of lust. And Queen Vashti refused. Now, she is the mother of Artaxerxes, the man that you're reading about in Nehemiah. So she's not just a queen, she is really a queen mother. And so there, there was a certain dignity that she would have had not only as the queen, but the fact that she's a mother. And so she absolutely refused. Now, the thing that really threw it into a crisis was, where did she refuse in front of all the women, right? And so do you remember the men and their reasoning for saying she needs to be banished from the kingdom? And it was because Queen Vashti might do what? Be a... Yeah, yeah, my, we, we went home... We went home on Sunday afternoon, and my, my wife says that Queen Basti, she was a women's liver. She was standing up to the men, you know. And so you remember that the crisis of the men was, we got to do something about this. I mean, after all, what if the other women of the kingdom hear about it? And then they'll rise up, and, you know, we got to crush Vashti. And so the uh, edict goes out that uh, uh, all the men are to lead their households and all the women are to be in submission. And uh, so Queen Vashti put a royal crisis uh, in effect. And then we introduced you to Esther. Uh, her name means star, and uh, her Persian name. Her Hebrew name, Hadassah, means uh, a myrtle or fragrance. So uh, it's a very beautiful name that she had been given by her mother and dad. Now, where were her mother and dad as we're studying this? Do you remember? Huh? 
they were deceased. So uh, she was early on in life. She was a, uh, an orphan. And so uh, God had a godly man in her life. His name was Mordecai. Uh, he was a Jewish man. He was a city leader because he spent every day sitting where? In the gate, all right? The gate was a place of commerce. It was a place of judgment. Uh, it was a place where the king's affairs would be dealt with among the people. And uh, so Mordecai it was in a position of power. Now, here's an interesting thing. Uh, when it came time uh, for uh, Ezra to lead the uh, home back to Israel, a group, there were not that many Jewish people that actually wanted to leave Babylon and go back. And the reason for that is that in Babylon, and especially in Persia, they ended up living uh, established lives. You might remember the prophet Jeremiah had told uh, the Jewish people, you're going to be there for 70 years, so set your roots, build your houses, and have sons and daughters. And uh, so by the time we get to this passage of scripture, uh, uh, Jerusalem fell in 586 BC. Well, here we are with Ahasuerus, it's 486 BC. So a whole century has passed when this man is coming to the throne. So the Jewish people were very comfortable in Babylon. And so when it was time to leave and go back, most of them said, we're not going back. We're happy where we are. And so in the Persian Empire, Jewish people could be in very prominent positions uh, in the government itself. And therefore, they were really not uh, desiring to leave, leave many of them. In fact, uh, if it was an earlier devotional. I can't remember which one it was, but um, I think it was Ezra was leading his group back to uh, Israel. And he went about one week's journey and he took a census and there was one tribe that wasn't represented. Do you know what tribe it was? The Levites. There were no Levites. So he stopped in the journey and he sent back and said, we need Levites here. Why? Because the worship, the sacrifices and all. So it's very interesting. Even the Levites were not apt to want to leave Babylon. All right. And then we come to uh, Haman. Oh, by the way, Mordecai had adopted Esther as his daughter. And then there was Haman, uh, and, I, and I'm describing him here as an evil political official. Now, you know all that, and I knew you knew all that, and I could have given you a test, and you would have made a hundred. All right, moving on, all right? Delusional, delusional, total delusional. All right, here we go. Esther 3 and 4 records a confrontation between Haman, a wicked political opportunist, and Mordecai, a man of godly principles. Now, I preached that Sunday morning, so I'm not going to go through it. Other, I'm going to keep moving. The one thing that happened was that Mordecai bowed not, uh, nor did Haman reverence. So the king had promoted um, uh, uh, Haman put him in a position of authority, really second to himself. And he told everybody in the kingdom uh, to bow and reverence uh, Haman. But Mordecai said, not me. I will not bow to the wicked. Now, let's pick this up here at Esther chapter 3 and verses 10 through 11. And I want to walk through this. So you have your Bible there? Let's go through it. And the king took his ring from his hand and he gave it unto Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agathite, the Jew's enemy. And the king said unto Haman, the silver is uh, given to thee, the people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. Now let me give you a couple of thoughts here. Uh, this um, Haman is um, from the Amalekite background. The Agatite or Gite is actually a title of a king. So Haman actually has a royal lineage in his background. And remember, Israel was told to kill them all when they went into the land. They did not. And so here we have what, seven, eight hundred years later, and here's the enemy of the Jews, and he's still alive and well. And the king then said unto Haman, 
the silver is given to thee. Uh, the people also to do with them as it seemeth good to thee. So uh, the people were actually, uh, there was a silver going to go into the king's coffers. The king in turn signed an edict and gave the ring. The ring was to seal the edict as it was sent out. And in effect, it was to kill all the Jews, kill them all, and plunder everything that they own. Verse 12, Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Haman had commanded unto the king's lieutenants, to the governors that were over every province, and to the rulers of every people of every province, according to the writing thereof. Anybody remember how many provinces there were in Persia? 127, very good. So each of those provinces has its own governor. And so this edict goes out. It goes out to all the provinces. It goes out in various languages. In the name of King Ahasuerus was it written and sealed with the king's ring. So this important document goes out. And essentially it is the death warrant uh, of all the Jews living in Persia. And so we read in verse 13, And the letters were sent by post and to all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all the Jews, young and old, children and women, in one day, uh, even upon the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. So it was to be a genocide. That is the effect that is there. It's interesting for me as I look at history, uh, I can only think of the Jewish people again and again and again. There are these edicts to kill, to destroy, to uh, annihilate. And yet, they are probably one of the smallest uh, center uh, groups of people in the world today. There's not that many. But it's so interesting that so much anger and bitterness is fomented among the nations and, uh, you know, watching our college campuses here in the United States and the brainwashed kids, and they are all in favor of supporting Hamas. Hamas is a, a wicked, butchering uh, uh, company of people, and they, they have absolutely oppressed the Palestinian people all these years, and it's just dreadful to watch. We're watching what happened in the 1930s it's happening again. We're watching it happen again. And sadly, uh, if things don't change in the United States, we have really been the uh, guardian in many ways of Israel as, as a nation. And uh, the path we're on right now is not a, not a good path. Not for Israel, it is not. And... Uh, other things we could say, but I, I won't spend time there. And so I, I don't want to read all these verses. It's not necessary. But anyway, copy the writing. The commandment goes out into every province. Post went out, hastened by the king's commandment. And the, this uh, annihilation, this genocide, was to take place 11 months after the edict was signed. So I'm going to keep going. Now, if you're Mordecai, you are horrified when you hear the edict. And he actually gets a copy of it. So we read in Esther chapter 4 and verse 1, When Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went out into the midst of the city, and he cried with a loud, uh, cried with a loud and a bitter cry. So Mordecai knew that this was because he had withstood Haman. So th that word goes out, and uh, Haman, uh, or Mordecai, is overwhelmed with sorrow and this picture of just, just wailing. So he's literally walking the streets of the city, ultimately coming to the gate. He'll come to the gate of the king. Let me walk you through some of this here then. Let's look at, first of all, Mordecai's grief. And that is his anguish after hearing the decree against the Jews. And again, I, I'm going to go back to the verse there. Just to give you a little bit of an indication. I, I want to um, rent in his clothes as expressing his grief. But the loud and bitter cry is literally a shriek. Um, uh, if you've ever been somewhere where um, 
uh, a family, maybe a, a mother has been told your, your child has died and, and they get that news and the wailing and the shrieking that you hear because of how deep the emotions are. Well, that's the picture that you have of Mordecai. He is literally overwhelmed with the grief of what that edict says. And that brings me to the second thing, and that is his circumstances. He and all the Jews lived under a death sentence. And so I'm going to read Esther chapter 4 and verse 10. And they came uh, even before the king's great gate. That is, uh, Mordecai did. He came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. In other words, if you had the appearance of a mourner or a beggar, you're not welcome at the king's gate, right? But that is exactly where Mordecai goes. He goes where he knows it's forbidden to go. But he's going there for a purpose. There's somebody beyond the gate that he's wanting to appeal to. And that's going to be Esther. Uh, verse 3, we have the lamentation. Uh, again, the Jews reacted in the same way that Mordecai did. There was great mourning among the Jews, fasting, weeping, and wailing. Many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So you think about this. Here's an absolute authority. He has signed an edict. Everyone will die who is Jewish. And so you realize father, mother, your sons, your daughters, your family, your, your friends, all, of, all are going to die. And there's nothing's going to change it. 11 months and you will be dead. And that's the edict. There, that's the absolute authority of a Persian king. Now, Esther learns about her uncle, her father, really, at this time. Her stepfather, her adopted father, maybe. Esther was distressed when she received news of Mordecai's grief. And she grieved for her uncle's sorrows. So, at this point, she appears to be unaware of the edict. Okay? She has no understanding of what is happening to her people. Why? She lives in the king's court. She is surrounded by Persian people. She does not know this edict that has gone out from what I can tell reading in verse uh, of the scripture. So here we are in verse 4. So Esther's maids and her chamberlains uh, came and they told it her. They told her what? Mordecai's at the gate. Now here's what's interesting. The king at this point, does not know that Esther is Jewish. She hasn't revealed that. But her maids and her chamberlains know her relationship with Mordecai. And there would be no doubt by Mordecai's dress that he was a Jewish man. So very interesting. They, the love that they have for her Already, you can see it here. Then was the queen exceedingly grieved as she sent raiment to clothe Mordecai and to take away his sackcloth from him, but he received it not. So what was Esther trying to do? She was trying to what? She, yeah, she didn't ask, why are you mourning and grieving? She just sent a change of clothes, right? So I, I, don't, I don't want my father to be dressed like that at the gate. So the first time she doesn't even ask about what has happened. And then verse five, after he refuses, she inquires about the cause of Mordecai's grief. So we read in verse five and six then, then called Esther. I want to make sure I pronounce this right. I've got it written out here. Uh, where am I? Then called Esther for Hathok, he was a Persian eunuch, one of the king's chamberlains, whom he, the king, had appointed to attend upon her. So she, he was basically a bodyguard. He was the caregiver of uh, Queen Esther uh, and gave him a commandment, sent him a message to Mordecai to know what it was and why it was. So when he refused to take the clothes that she sent, she sends this uh, hotok back to Mordecai to find out why. Why are you at the gate? What is wrong? And to know what it was and why it was. So uh, he went forth to Mordecai unto the gate, a street of the city, which was before the king's gate. 
And then he, she receives an answer that uh, he begins to ponder. So well, let's look. I don't know that it's, oh, it is up here. So I'm going to keep reading that. Here we go. And Mordecai told him, this Hathok uh, servant of, of Esther, of all that had happened uh, unto him and of the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay to the king's treasures for the Jews to destroy them. I'm going to keep going. Also, he gave him a copy, the copy, the edict of the writing of the decree that was given uh, at Shushan to destroy them, uh, to show uh, it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to change uh, or to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him and to make requests before him for her people. And then we read, and uh, Ahotak came and he told Esther the words of Mordecai. So at this point, she did not know why he was weeping and why he was mourning. And that brings us then to Esther's crisis of faith. So here's the dilemma. She's gotten the edict. She has read the edict and the edict says that all the Jews are going to die. Now, Mordecai obviously is in that number, and particularly he's the one that Haman is wanting to see dead. And so we read again, uh, and again, Esther spake unto Hatak and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. And then we read in verse 11 and 12. And all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come uh, unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his to put him to death, except uh, such to whom the king should hold out the golden scepter that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these 30 days. So let's back up. So what is, what is Esther facing I need you to go into the king. You need to appeal to the king to save the lives of, the, of your people, the Jews. And so that's her dilemma. Her dilemma continues, though, to go into the king uninvited is at the risk of your life. If you go in uninvited, he can take your life. And that brings us then to Mordecai's directions. And uh, beginning in verse 13, he is an admonition uh, uh, that he sends to Esther. Then Mordecai, we read, commanded, uh, commanded to answer Esther, think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. So what is he saying? Because you're a queen doesn't mean that you're going to escape the edict. Now we already know from the er earlier verse that her chamberlains and her maids, they know she has a relationship with Mordecai. And so there's already some in the palace that understands her heritage, her lineage, her background. And so Mordecai basically is saying, listen, the palace is not going to be a safe place. So give a uh, continue verse 14. If thou altogether holdest thy peace, don't say anything at this time. Then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. So somebody tell me, what do you think 14, verse 14 is telling Esther? If you don't fulfill your responsibility, your opportunity to be a savior for your people, then God will choose somebody else. Think about that. That's a pretty striking thought, isn't it? Uh, that God can turn to another. If we're not willing to fulfill God's plan, God's will, to walk out his plan and his purpose with our life, God can't turn to somebody else. So, but Esther, you're put there for such a time. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. Who knoweth whether thou art come to this kingdom for such a time as this? I love that expression. That last phrase is the sovereignty of God, isn't it? Who knows? But this is God's plan. Can, I've said this to you recently in several different messages. I really believe for you and for me that this is our hour to shine. Not for our glory, but this is our moment in a world that 
is searching and in a world that is hurting. This is our time. And I believe that burden should be on every one of our hearts as we're out in public. This is my moment to serve the Lord wherever I am. Several weeks ago, you gave a sermon that really hit me where I live, and it's the word that I want to get. It's called Watchman. Watchman on the wall. Yep. The Watchman. Yep. And believe me, there isn't a greater person I've ever seen. You had that. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think we're living in a culture that's looking for watchmen. You know, people are wondering, what's going on? And, and believe me, they may not admit it to you, but there's a lot of fear come the election this November. There's fear of what's going to happen. I mean, I'm waiting for the possibility of rioting in the streets again. Remember the last time they shut down Seattle and they shut down Portland and all of that was, was uh, adding gas to a flame to unsettle the nation. Now you add to that, here we are four years later, and 10 million undocumented illegal immigrants in our country. And we know that many are scattered throughout the country that are terrorists. Even our own government saying there's terrorists in the, in the country. And so you wonder at what point Will we see the unfolding of great events that will be a great sorrow? But you and I are blessed to be living in this hour. And that's what uh, Mordecai says to Esther. For such a time as this. Will you say that with me? For such a time as this. That's true of your life. For such a time as as this. Uh, I'll tell you a, a quick story with uh, Randy. I hope I won't embarrass him, but uh, Danny uh, Sweat, someone I've known and admired for years, well, he, he worked with Randy 20 years at least, and beyond that, you worked at a, another time, and uh, Danny calls and he says, Randy Hurst is moving back to Tampa. And I said, you got to be kidding me. He says, no, he's moving back to Tampa. He says, well, you need to reach out to him and see if he can come and, you know, be a help to you. Well, I reached out in a heartbeat. And I, I really felt, I, and I told Sheila at the time, that I felt for such a time as this, you know. Um, and Dan back in the back, Pastor Mills in the back, I, I've told him so many times the things he's doing and taking off of me and Eric is for such a time as this. For the, for the first time in really 30 years of ministry here, I feel like I actually have time to study and to prepare and to write. And uh, it, it's so refreshing for me for such a time as this. And so I would say with each one of you, for such a time as this. Steve Armstrong, uh, when he called me and we met at Red Robin, Red Robin, and uh, Mr. Music Extraordinaire, I didn't know who he was from Adam, but uh, I go in and I shake hands with him. He's got rough, callous hands. What kind of music director has rough, callous hands? And then when we sat down and he started sharing what God was doing in his life and I mean, you were working construction and all of this stuff all, and, and all that talent. And here I had spent the last four years doing the, the choir and all here. Uh, sometimes Pastor Peter and, and myself, we, we look at each other and say, we don't even have a clue how we did it. How in the world did we get through that time? But for such a time as this. Let me move on. Uh, uh, his appeal to Esther. So he admonished Esther. And then he appealed to Esther again for such a time as this. I'm going to keep moving. And uh, who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom. Here we go. I'm almost at the end. Uh, Esther's courageous decision. And I love th th her testimony here. Uh, and I wanted to give you three thoughts that go with this. Here's the, the verses, and then I'll give you the three thoughts. Then we read, Then Esther bade them return unto Mordecai, this saying. She says to her, really her, adop her adoptive father, Go, and gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, the, the summer palace of Persia. Fast ye for me, neither eat nor drink three days, night or day, I also and my maidens will fast likewise, 
And so will I go in unto the king, which is not according to the law, and say it with me, and if I perish, I perish. Guarantee you there will be times in your life that your faith will be tested. And I hope that it resonates in your ears, your thoughts. If I perish, I perish. In other words, I'm going to do the right thing. And I'm not sure what the outcome's going to be. But I will do the right thing. Let me finish up. So we have her decision was revealed in three things. Or her, her decision revealed three things. The first was confidence in Mordecai's counsel. The second was faith in the Lord. And the third was the affection for her people. So three things drove her decision to say, if I perish, I perish. That an absolute resignation to God's will. Now, let me say, uh, ask a question. Uh, is that fatalism? Are we looking at fatalism? Fatalism basically says, well, this is fate. But a believer, we look at circumstances and we say, this is providential, right? The difference is who's in control. Fate, you know, it gives, it's almost like an evolutionary concept that God's just, um, if there is a God, he's a spectator. But providence says there is a God and he's in control of my life. In your life. So uh, I know I'm almost done. Here we go. Uh, she realized the palace would not insulate her from her danger. So she accepted that. Um, you are there for such a time. But if you don't fulfill God's will. Who he will turn to another. I, I thought the king's decree was irrevocable. Remember the Persian kings. Once they made an edict. They could not withdraw it. So once that edict was signed. All the Jews will perish. There was nothing that could be done. He could not even retract his own edict. So it was signed and sealed. But the king's decree was also universal. All Jews everywhere will perish. I'm going to keep going. She resigned herself to fasting and prayer. So I, I thought it was very, I don't, yeah, I, I thought it was very interesting. Not only did she urge Mordecai and all the Jews to pray, but look at what she says here about her, those who attended her. I also and my maidens will fast likewise. So there we go again. Here is this Jewish woman and her testimony has been so powerful that her, her maidens and her chamberlains, they all know her association with Mordecai, who is the Jew that sits at the gate. And yet they share her heart. Do they know the Lord? I don't know in this instance. But I do know they respected her testimony so much that they would join her in fasting. Now, uh, she reconciled herself to trust the Lord. And I'm going to keep going. And here we go. If I perish, I perish. I think I have a couple more verses on here. So Mordecai went his way and he did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Let me close with two thoughts. Here's the first one. Proverbs 21 and verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Do you realize that there's no one in your life in authority that God can't move their heart? Think about that. Might be a boss, might be a family member, but the authorities in your life, God can move their hearts. They can make decisions that you would say, I never saw that coming. And so God is in charge. And then lastly, a reminder, to whomsoever much is given of him shall much be required. To whom men have committed much of him, they shall or will ask the more. The opportunities that God gives you are sacred opportunities. And we're accountable for them. May God find us faithful, right? We may not face what Esther did. Uh, if I perish, I perish, but surely we'll face challenges. And I pray that God will find us faithful in that day. Let's pray.